children by Anton Chekhov. Papa and Mama and Aunt Nadia are not at home. They have gone to a christening party at the house of that old officer who rides on the little grey horse. While waiting for them to come home, Grisha, Anya, Alyosha, Sonia, and the cook's son, Andrei, are sitting at the table in the dining room, playing at lotto. To tell the truth, it is bedtime, but how can one go to sleep without hearing from Mama what the baby was like at the christening and what they had for supper? The table, lighted by a hanging lamp, is dotted with numbers, nutshells, scraps of paper and little bits of glass. Two cards lie in front of each player and a heap of bits of glass for covering the numbers. In the middle of the table is a white saucer with five kopecks in it. Beside the saucer, a half-eaten apple, a pair of scissors and a plate on which they have been told to put their nutshells. The children are playing for money. The steak is a kopeck. The rule is, if anyone cheats, he's turned out at once. There is no one in the dining room but the players, and Nurse Agafya Ivanovna is in the kitchen, showing the cook how to cut a pattern, while their elder brother Vasya, a schoolboy in the fifth class, is lying on the sofa in the drawing room, feeling bored. They are playing with zest. The greatest excitement is expressed on the face of Grisha. He is a small boy of nine, with a head cropped so that the bare skin shows through, chubby cheeks and thick lips. He is already in the preparatory class, and so is regarded as grown-up and the cleverest. He is playing entirely for the sake of the money. If there had been no kopecks in the saucer, he would have been asleep long ago. His brown eyes stray uneasily and jealously over the other players' cards. The fear that he may not win, envy and the financial combinations of which his cropped head is full, will not let him sit still and concentrate his mind. He fidgets as though he were sitting on thorns. When he wins, he snatches up the money greedily and instantly puts it in his pocket. His sister Anya, a girl of eight, with a sharp chin and clever, shining eyes, is also afraid that someone else may win. She flushes and turns pale and watches the players keenly. The kopecks do not interest her. Success in the game is for her a question of vanity. The other sister, Sonia, a child of six with a curly head and a complexion such as is seen only in very healthy children, expensive dolls and the faces on bonbon boxes, is playing lotto for the process of the game itself. There is bliss all over her face. Whoever wins, she laughs and claps her hands. Alyosha, a chubby, spherical little figure, gasps, breathes hard through his nose and stares open-eyed at the cards. He is moved neither by covetousness nor vanity. So long as he is not driven out of the room or sent to bed, he is thankful. He looks phlegmatic, but at heart he is rather a little beast. He is not there so much for the sake of the lotto as for the sake of the misunderstandings which are inevitable in the game. He is greatly delighted if one hits another or calls him names. He ought to have run off somewhere long ago, but he won't leave the table for a minute for fear they should steal his counters or his kopecks. As he can only count the units and numbers which end in naught, Anya covers his numbers for him. The fifth player, the cook's son, Andrei, a dark-skinned and sickly-looking boy in a cotton shirt with a copper cross on his breast, stands motionless, looking dreamily at the numbers. He takes no interest in winning or in the success of the others, because he is entirely engrossed by the arithmetic of the game, and it's far from complex theory. How many numbers there are in the world, he is thinking, and how is it they don't get mixed up? 
They all shout out the numbers in turn, except Sonia and Alyosha. To vary the monotony, they have invented in the course of time a number of synonyms and comic nicknames. Seven, for instance, is called the oven rake. Eleven, the sticks. Seventy-seven, Semyon Semyonich. Ninety, grandfather, and so on. The game is going merrily. Thirty-two, cries Grisha, drawing the little yellow cylinders out of his father's cap. Seventeen, oven rake. Twenty-eight, lay them straight. Anya sees that Andrei has let twenty-eight slip. At any other time she would have pointed it out to him, but now when her vanity lies in the saucer with the copex, she is triumphant. Twenty-three, Grisha goes on. Semyon Semyonich, nine. A beetle, a beetle, cries Sonia, pointing to a beetle running across the table. Ay! Don't kill it, says Alyosha in his deep bass. Perhaps it's got children. Sonia follows the black beetle with her eyes and wonders about its children. What tiny little beetles they must be. Forty-three, one, Grisha goes on, unhappy at the thought that Anya has already made two fours. Six, game, I've caught the game, cries Sonia, rolling her eyes coquettishly and giggling. The player's countenances lengthen. Must make sure, says Grisha, looking with hatred at Sonia, exercising his rights as a big boy and the cleverest, Grisha takes upon himself to decide what he wants that they do. Sonia's reckoning is slowly and carefully verified, and to the great regret of her fellow players, it appears that she has not cheated. Another game is begun. I did see something yesterday, says Anya, as though to herself. Philip Filipich turned his eyelids inside out somehow, and his eyes looked red and dreadful, like an evil spirit's. I saw it too, says Grisha. Eight, and a boy at our school can move his ears. Twenty-seven. Andre looks up at Grisha, meditates, and says, I can move my ears too. Well, then move them. Andre moves his eyes, his lips and his fingers, and fancies that his ears are moving too. Everyone laughs. He's a horrid man, that Philip Filipich, sighs Sonia. He came into our nursery yesterday, and I had nothing on but my chemise, and I felt so improper. Game, Grisha cries suddenly, snatching the money from the saucer. I've got the game. You can look and see if you like. The cook's son looks up and turns pale. Then I can't go on playing any more, he whispers. Why not? Because, because I have got no more money. You can't play without money, says Grisha. Andre ransacks his pockets once more to make sure. Finding nothing in them but crumbs and a bitten pencil, he drops the corners of his mouth and begins blinking miserably. He's on the point of crying. I'll put it down for you, says Sonia, unable to endure his look of agony. Only mind, you must pay me back afterwards. The money is brought and the game goes on. I believe they're ringing somewhere, says Anya, opening her eyes wide. They all leave off playing and gaze open-mouthed at the dark window. The reflection of the lamp glimmers in the darkness. It was your fancy. At night, they only ring in the cemetery, says Andre. And what do they ring there for? To prevent robbers from breaking into the church. They're afraid of the bells. And what do robbers break into the church for? asks Sonia. Everyone knows what for. To kill the watchman. A minute passes in silence. They all look at one another, shudder, and go on playing. This time, Andre wins. 
He's cheated, Alyosha booms out, apropos of nothing. What a lie! I haven't cheated. Andre turns pale, his mouth works, and he gives Alyosha a slap on the head. Alyosha glares angrily, jumps up, and with one knee on the table, slaps Andre on the cheek. Each gives the other a second blow, and both howl. Sonia, feeling such horrors too much for her, begins crying too, and the dining room resounds with lamentations in different notes. But do not imagine that that is the end of the game. Before five minutes are over, the children are laughing and talking peaceably again. Their faces are tear-stained, but that does not prevent them from smiling. Alyosha is positively blissful. There has been a squabble. Vasya, the fifth-born schoolboy, walks into the dining room. He looks sleepy and disillusioned. This is revolting, he thinks, seeing Grisha feel in his pockets, in which the kopecks are jingling. How can they give children money? And how can they let them play games of chance? A nice way to bring them up, I must say. It's revolting. But the children's play is so tempting that he feels an inclination to join them and to try his luck. Wait a minute and I'll sit down to a game, he says. Put down a kopeck. In a minute, he says, fumbling in his pockets. I haven't a kopeck, but here's a rouble. I'll stake a rouble. No, no, no. You must put down a kopeck. You stupids. A rouble is worth more than a kopeck anyway, the schoolboy explains. Whoever wins can give me change. No, please, go away. The fifth-form schoolboy shrugs his shoulders and goes into the kitchen to get change from the servants. It appears there is not a single kopeck in the kitchen. In that case, you give me change, he urges Grisha, coming back from the kitchen. I'll pay you for the change, won't you? Come, give me ten kopecks for a rouble. Grisha looks suspiciously at Vasya, wondering whether it isn't some trick, a swindle. I won't, he says, holding his pockets. Vasya begins to get cross and abuses them, calling them idiots and blockheads. I'll put down a stake for you, Vasya, says Sonia. Sit down. He sits down and lays two cards before him. Anya begins counting the numbers. I've dropped a kopeck, Grisha announces suddenly in an agitated voice. Wait! He takes the lamp and creeps under the table to look for the kopeck. They clutch at nutshells and all sorts of nastiness, knock their heads together, but do not find the kopeck. They begin looking again, and look till Vasya takes the lamp out of Grisha's hands and puts it in its place. Grisha goes on looking in the dark, but at last the kopeck is found. The players sit down at the table and mean to go on playing. Sonia's asleep, Alyosha announces. Sonia, with her curly head lying on her arms, is in a sweet, sound, tranquil sleep, as though she had been asleep for an hour. She has fallen asleep by accident while the others were looking for the kopeck. Come along, lie on Mama's bed, says Anya, leading her away from the table. Come along. They all troop out with her, and five minutes later, Mama's bed presents a curious spectacle. Sonia is asleep. Alyosha is snoring beside her. With their heads to the other's feet, sleep Grisha and Anya. The cook's son, Andre, too, has managed to snuggle in beside them. Near them lie the kopecks that have lost their power till the next game. Good night. If you like the video, put a like, subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to not miss our new videos.